come to the uh, the last discussion on thyroid uh, diseases and uh, here I'll be doing a bit, bit of a mixed uh, presentations and uh, it's a common thing to find this uh, what is called the physiological goiter this happens uh, more often in the pubertal age of the, uh, the females and also during pregnancies where the demand for the thyroxine hormones are high and therefore the TSH rises and there's a stimulation of the gland and a diffuse enlargement will ensue. Sometimes it may be visible but sometimes they are not that visible, they are generally not very big. So then but how to come to the diagnosis of a physiological goiter? One thing as I said it's the, the, the age and like most of pubertal age, the youngers and then also during pregnancy they may have. So they'll come and complain of the swelling and of course there's uh, movement swallowing and uh, when you feel actually it's a, a small enlargement and diffusely affecting both lobes and generally they, they don't have any symptoms of uh, hypo or hyperthyroidism. They will be clinical euthyroid on symptom inquiry and also uh, your clinical assessment, the pulse rate and the eye signs, everything you look at, and they are clinical euthyroid. So then the investigations, we have to now confirm it's a clinical diagnosis of physiological goiter. So uh, ultrasound scan it will show a diffuse enlargement of both lobes which is mild and do the TSH now the TSH report in a significant number they are either in the higher range of the normal range but in the higher side or they may be uh, elevated than the normal upper limit so if it's elevated over the upper limit, it may be worth getting a T3 precursor also. But anyway, the treatment is to get this TSH to the lower level. So it will stop further stimulating the, the gland. So you treat with thyroxine, some dose according to your TSH level. And then after about six weeks, you can titrate and get a dose that where TSH is in the lower uh, limit uh, range. And like annually, you can follow up them with TSH values but one thing to remember if uh, the person is already pregnant or he becomes pregnant in future in that case the TSH has to be repeated a couple of times maybe at least once in three months during the pregnancy because uh, say so you have started a girl on thyroxine for physiological goiter and if they get pregnant uh, in a significant number the dose requirement will go up so during pregnancy, in a significant number, thyroxine doses will be, have to be increased. So it's important to remember your follow-up with TSH could be annual, but in case of pregnancy, you have to do at the early uh, stages of pregnancy and you will have to repeat a couple of times. And then thyroiditis. Again, it's a very small point. So they won't become very big. These are autoimmune diseases. And they may have some pain because of the inflammation. They may have some pain. And a majority are euthyroid on questioning. Uh, but of course, both hypo and hyperthyroidism can happen in thyro thyroiditis. So that your, with your physical uh, the symptoms and also physical examination, you will get a clue. And it's very straightforward. You do the scan. And the scan also, the radiologist will tell you it's suggestive of thyroiditis. And then course, you do your thyroid auto antibodies, it will confirm they will be elevated in thyroiditis. And thyroid functions, of course, it could be anything. It could be anything. You know, they, they may be in a state of hyperthyroidism, hypo, but in a majority, they are euthyroid. Your T3, T4 are normal, but TSH tend to be in the higher range. So if the TSH is high, you get treated with thyroxine and get to the lower values. And for, for people with a lot of pain, uh, short courses of prednisolone also will be effective and one thing to uh, mention is that they will have small glands and when you feel also you feel a very small goiter sometimes it may feel a bit hard 
But anyway, your scan says uh, thyroiditis, your thyroglobulins are high, and these cases it is not necessary to do a FNAC. There is no indication unless the radiologist says there's some suspicious area. Otherwise, you just manage your scan and your PSH and follow up again. You can repeat the scan after one year and also your thyroid function, uh, the TSH. So, depending on the TSH values, you just alter the treatment. And then few words about uh, radioiodine ablation, which we discussed, it's used in two situations. One thing is in differentiated thyroid cancer, after surgery, after your total thyroidectomy, you do a radioiodine ablation to ablate if there's any residual tissue in the thyroid bed and also if there are any uh, meds. And then also the second use of thyroid ablation is in thyrotoxicosis. Thyrotoxicosis, we have discussed that the initial uh, step of management will be medical treatment and get the new thyroid. And in the in the nodular goiters, the multinodule and solitary nodule, they need ablation. And if the gland size is small, both these situations, you can use radioiodine ablation. Again, similarly in Graves' disease. A significant number will go into a medical remission with treatment, uh, the medical treatment alone. But those who are not responding to medical treatment or they respond and they get a relapse. And after restarting your treatment, again, uh, one will need ablation. Again, you may do a total thyroidectomy or if the gland is not very big, you can do radioiodine ablation. So those are the indications. And the preparations and post-therapy management, they are quite different in the two categories and differentiated thyroid cancer again we discussed this earlier it is better to do with a TSH stimulation because with TSH stimulation the eye uptake of the iodine will be good by the residual the tissue the thyroid tissue or the meds uh, and there will be good ablation so to get a high TSH you stop your thyroxine for about four to six weeks so the TSH will go up and then you do the ablation and also one important point is prior to radioiodine ablation uh, once you stop the thyroxine with the T high TSH get a baseline thyroglobulin assay also but this uh, period of hypothyroidism is difficult for the patient and another way is of course you don't stop the thyroxine but the day of the uh, procedure give an intramuscular dose of precombinant TSH, artificial TSH, you will get a high surge of TSH and you do the ablation. So post-therapy management after differential thyroid cancer. So if you start, if you stop the thyroxine and done as it's usually done in most of the centers, you restart on thyroxine. And the principle we have discussed earlier, you give a high dose of thyroxine, not to make the patient toxic, but to get the T3 to higher value and uh, in order to get a suppression of the TSH because TSH stimulates thyroid uh, cells so it is better to get the TSH suppressed so that's one and then of course your follow-up you can do your uh, thyroid functions maybe annually but the first one you may do after about two months just to see whether your dose titrations are adequate and also uh, one point is to see the degree of ablation now we have got a pre-ablation thyroglobulin level and so after about two months you can repeat that you can repeat that and see so, so you get a good ablation thyroglobulin has to come down and with follow-up you use thyroglobulin in case you get a rising theta then of course you have to consider reablation. then thyrotoxicosis if you're going to ablate a thyrotoxic uh, thyrotoxic patient now by this time the patient i said the first principle is you treat medically and get the toxicity control so by this stage, the patient is euthyroid. But if you consider of radioiodine ablation, you stop the antithyroid medicine for about two weeks. So the, the, the hyperactive cells will again start becoming hyperactive. Now they were suppressed all this time with carbamazole. And when the toxic cells become hyperactive, when you give the radioiodine, they will take the iodine uh, and competing against the normal thyroid. Cells. So, major, majority of the iodine will be considered in the hyperactive cell. So, you get a preferential ablation of the toxic cell. So, your uh, 
ablation result of ablation also will be good so you want only your toxic cells to uh, die off leaving the normal uh, the cells so you won't get a post one thing the toxicity will disappear and also you won't get a post procedure the chance of getting post procedure hypothyroidism becomes low so uh, you stop your carb muscle for two weeks and do the ablation or perform the ablation then after the uh, radioadine ablation you don't start any drug you neither carb muscle nor thyroxine you just wait about uh, two months and see repeat your thyroid functions because this ablations are a bit of a so slower process so you wait two months repeat your thyroid functions if they have come to normal level the patient is cured of the toxic situation uh, if they have come hypothyroid of course you have to start on thyroxine therapy if the ablation is not adequate you can ablate for a second time if the second time also if it recur if it doesn't it's not successful of course you have to consider surgery but if after successful ablation uh, the patient may be euthyroid you don't start on in thyroxine or patient has got over treated and hypo you may start some thyroxine uh, dose and you annually follow up them lifelong uh, just to see their thyroxine requirements then uh, the when you are going for radio ablation you consider radio ablation iodine ablation for a patient please exclude that the patient is pregnant it's an absolute contraindication and then of course relative contraindications a breastfeeding mother because you will have to keep the patient away from children everybody i mean they, they are kept in isolation for uh, two to three days uh, so therefore uh, breastfeeding uh, mothers and the people who are in close contact with children if they are the children are very dominant uh, dependent on them then of course there are relative contraindications unless you stop those and you have to you can keep the person away from the children for this time uh, you, you can't uh, do the radio ablation during that period but pregnancy is of course absolute contraindication then another small point about uh, thyrotoxic crisis uh, thyrotoxic crisis is a medical emergency and it happens in a person who is toxic the toxicity is not controlled so in a situation where the toxicity is not controlled uh, many stimuli can push them into a crisis where there's a sudden uh, uncontrolled release of uh, hormones with a very high levels suddenly circulating in the bloodstream and the worst stimulus is of course if you operate on a thyroid gland during handling it will just start releasing so you should never operate uh, do a thyroidectomy in a toxic patient without control that's one then any other stressful situation in a toxic patient not controlled it can push to thyrotoxic crisis like any other surgery or trauma or childbirth burns sepsis so any any uh, stressful situation can induce a thyrotoxic crisis and radioiodine ablation uh, it's not a sudden sort of a stimulus but of course it has some risk of inducing a thyrotoxic crisis so what are the features most of the features are due to your sympathetic uh, hyperactivity so they have a hyperpyrexia they will have tachycardia and they can go into various forms of arrhythmias they can even go into arrest and cardiac failure so you should have high cardiac output failure and then they can be confused or in a delirium so it's very important that they will be managed in a intensive care unit because they will need a lot of organ support and very close monitoring so what are the key things that you have to do one thing they'll have to be actively cool to, to come out of this hyperpyrexia you may use antipyretics it's advisable to avoid aspirin and iv fluids of course now they will be losing a lot of fluid because of the hyperdynamic circulation excessive sweating uh, but of course it has to be very carefully judged because the patient may be in a bit of a failure also and also some will need ventilator support and selective people may need cardioversion so that's why they have to be in the ICU and if they're not on carb muscle already you start on a bit of a high dose even if they are on carb muscle you may increase the dose uh, to a higher level and of course one will need propranolol for rapid control and in very severe cases of course better to give IV but if not 
you can start oral high dose if you're giving IV remember it is a very small dose that you give IV compared to oral doses now most most of the illnesses when you compare uh, treating with a with a oral drug and the same drug IV most of in severe situations you give a higher dose of the IV but here it's different because what you take orally only a little bit gets to the circulation because this uh, drug in the, during a first hepatic uh, uh, passage itself most of the uh, propranolol is cleared and only a little bit enters IV so when you're doing IV very small dose but of course you may repeat this once in 15 minutes depending on your response but you are not going over 10 milligrams of the total then some will need hydrocortisone some may need uh, for their anxiety or their confusion agitation to be settled with some form of sedation and it's very important to manage the precipitating cause uh, unless this the problem will be there and the precipitating cause itself may be life-threatening for the patient so it's a total care so that's see that is how a tyrotoxic crisis is managed